Do you like happy endings? I think there's probably something in all of us that generally likes a good, happy ending. We want to find out who done it. We want to see the murderer caught or the hero escape or the couple fall in love. Uh, We're frustrated, aren't we, when books or movies end in such a way that everything's up in the air. Things are just left in the balance. Uh, There's no conclusion and there's no happily ever after scenario. If you've been following with us in these studies through Hosea, you'll know that we've described it as a love story. A love story. A love story not merely between the prophet Hosea and his promiscuous wife Gomer, Uh, but a love story between God and Israel. We have those two pictures set forth between us, but before us. And truth be told, at times, the book has seemed the furthest thing from a love story, hasn't it? Uh, Some of you have said exactly those words to me. Uh, But as we come to these final two chapters, we do find wonderfully... Uh, This love story has a truly happy ending. But not immediately. Not immediately. In these final two chapters, we have arguably the darkest chapter of the book. Chapter 13 sat side by side with the brightest chapter of the book. Chapter 14. And if we ended with chapter 13... I think we would be a very sorry bunch indeed. But we don't end there. We don't end there. And thankfully Hosea continues and he speaks of a happily ever after. So we want to consider these two chapters this evening. Uh, We'll do so under four headings. We'll spend most of our time in the first and really a minute or two on the last Uh, Really, the fourth one is a very short point indeed. So firstly, God's announcement of victory over death. This is chapter 13 altogether. God's announcement of victory over death. Victory over death. In this 13th chapter, we come to... Uh, The climax of Hosea's prophecies uh, on doom, his prophecies of doom, if you can call it a climax, it's maybe maybe the depth of the prophecies of doom. Uh, Apart from one verse in this chapter, it is exceedingly dark, exceedingly dark. In the opening verses, Hosea takes his hearers back to their past. Uh, Not unlike last week in chapter 12. He reminds them, verses 1 to 3, uh, there was once a time when the people of God were a force to be reckoned with. Verse 1, when Ephraim spoke, there was trembling. He was exalted in Israel. Ephraim Uh, had become the prominent tribe. They were one of the 12 tribes, but they had become the prominent tribe in this northern Israel group. Uh, You remember that the nation of Israel earlier had been divided in two. You had the 10 tribes in the north forming their own nation, and you had the two tribes in the south, uh, known generally as Judah in the south, Uh, But Ephraim was the dominant tribe in the north. Verse 1 puts it, he was exalted in Israel. And so much so that Israel and Ephraim, uh, they're almost interchangeable names for that whole northern group, that northern kingdom. But what had become of this once highly respected tribe and nation. End of verse 1. But he incurred guilt through Baal and died. They became too puffed up. 
with their own self-importance. And in their pride, they behaved as if they didn't need God. And they turned to Baal worship. They turned to Baal worship. The consequence of which, Hosea says, was that they died. They died. In some ways, that's a repeated message in the Bible, friends. That the nation or the individual who deliberately turns away from the one true living God is dead spiritually. Dead spiritually. Like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. After they sinned, though they continued to live physically, spiritually, that the moment they disobeyed, they died. They died spiritually. That's Ephraim. That's Ephraim. And Hosea piles up the death metaphors in this chapter. Word picture upon word picture. Verse 3. They shall be like the morning mist. Or like the dew that goes early away. Like, like the chaff that swirls around the threshing floor. Or like smoke from a window. Now it's, it's the people described this way. Like, like morning mist. Like morning dew, like, like chaff, all these fleeting, passing things. Verses 12 and 13, uh, there's another metaphor given. And it's maybe a little unsettling. Verses 12 and 13, especially 13. You will be like a mother in childbirth, Hosea says. And the labor pains have come, but no child. No child. And it's a picture of death, really, verse 13. We should understand in those days, without specialist maternity units, uh, without incubators, that sort of incident would have meant inevitable death for both mother and child. So these vivid word paintings and pictures, speaking of God's judgment, these people, Hosea says, they, they won't last. Judgment is coming. Death is looming. And we know from the history books that that's exactly what happened. Within a few short years of Hosea's ministry, Ephraim was completely destroyed by Assyria. And they passed into political oblivion. And that's what verse 15 speaks of. Verse 15. Though he may flourish among his brothers. That's Ephraim. Flourishing among his peers. The east wind. That's a reference to the Assyrians. The east wind. The wind of the Lord shall come. Rising from the wilderness. And his fountain shall dry up. His spring shall be parched. It shall strip his treasury. And the atrocities described here are horrific friends verse 16 verse 16 speaks of Samaria that's the capital of the north being utterly torn apart how the invaders would come in barbaric fashion mercilessly dashing their little ones in pieces and ripping open pregnant women and Hosea's point in all of this is that God's people, Ephraim, that isn't the moment when they died, when Assyria came knocking on the door. But rather, it was years before, verse 1, when they left God in favor of Baal, when they committed spiritual adultery. And it's worth noting, friends, this terrible devastation that would come. The Assyrians aren't the only ones responsible. Uh, verses 7 and 8, God says, I'm going to do it to them. I will be responsible. Verses 7 and 8, uh, startling verses. I am to them like a lion, like a leopard. I will lurk beside the way. I will fall upon them like a bear robbed of her cubs. 
I will tear open their breast. I will devour them like a lion as a wild beast would rip them open. In other words, the Assyrians are merely instruments of judgment in God's hand. Hosea puts it very plainly. Verse 9. He destroys you, O Israel. Now, what are are we to make of that, friends? This description of God's anger and judgment, of God pictured as as a vicious predator. Can your view of God cope with those verses? Hosea is fairly clear. That the people of God have fallen so low in this chapter. That they were utterly deserving of God's wrath and judgment. He not only describes how they corrupted the worship of God. But in 4 to 6 they forgot the blessing of God. He describes how the Lord had saved them and provided for them, but they forgot all about him. Verses 10 and 11 describe how the people repeatedly looked to earthly kings instead of their heavenly king. They rejected God's protection, God's love in favor of someone else. It's Romans 1.21, isn't it? Romans 1, 21, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. These are people who have willfully, deliberately, and repeatedly stirred up and, and provoked the anger of God. And so God says, judgment is inevitable and judgment is just. And friends, we've got to look at this passage and ask ourselves, are we so different? Are we so different? We might not be guilty in exactly the same way, but Baal worship, have we not repeatedly put other things in front of God? Our families, our careers, our pleasures, our pastimes. Have we not forgotten, perhaps in a way greater than Israel, have we not forgotten the many blessings we have received from his hand? Blessings beyond number. Have we not rejected his love and protection and have turned to anything else under the sun instead of turning to the one who can actually help Like Israel, like Ephraim, we too deserve judgment, death. The people around us this evening deserve the same judgment, death. This is an exceedingly dark chapter. But there is a wonderful verse of hope within it. Did you notice it? Could you find it? Verse 14 Of this chapter. In all this darkness. In all this despair. The words of verse 14 give wonderful hope. Wonderful light. This is God's announcement of victory. I shall ransom them from the power of Sheol. I shall redeem them from death. And I do think it's better to translate this verse positively rather than negatively. Some Bibles go for a negative translation. Shall I ransom? Uh, Shall I redeem? It does seem to me a better rendering would be, I shall ransom them from the power of Sheol. I shall redeem them from death. O death, where are your plagues? O Sheol, where is your sting? Do do, do the words ring a bell? Do they ring a bell for, I'm sure they do for many of you. Paul quotes them in 1 Corinthians 15. Marvelous words of hope. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Words quoted at many a graveside. Words of glorious promise. God ransoming his people from the power of Sheol. Sheol's a place of death. The place where the dead go. I will ransom them from death. 
These people who have offended God, rejected God, forgotten God, rebelled against God, but God has not abandoned them. He speaks of sending one who would ransom them, redeem them, paying the price to bring them back. It's it's speaking of Christ who would come and rescue his people from the power of death. Death does not have to be the end of the story, Hosea is saying. Death does not have to be the end of your story. So though this is a dark, dark chapter, tucked within it we find truly happily ever after words. Words that speak of victory over death, victory over the grave. So there is an announcement here, a prophecy of Jesus Christ Coming to win the victory over death. God's announcement of victory over death. Secondly, moving into chapter 14. God's appeal to return. 14 verses 1 to 3. Verses 1 to 3. God's appeal to return. This is just a little chapter. 14. Just nine verses yet. This is in many ways the pinnacle of the whole book. It really does portray the happiest of happy endings. Maybe you're here this evening and your life feels the furthest thing from a happily ever after. It feels the furthest thing. Maybe you feel far from God this evening. Maybe you just feel spiritually empty. As if you're no longer walking in nearness. No longer walking closely with him. Well to all of us there's an invitation extended. Verse 1. Return O Israel to the Lord your God. For you have stumbled because of your iniquity. What a glorious invitation that is. Notice, it's an invitation to return to the Lord your God. That's striking. In spite of all the people have done, God is still their God. The Lord your God. Hosea is saying, he hasn't given up on you yet. Return to the Lord your God. I wonder if there's anyone this evening that's here and that needs To hear this gracious invitation. This wonderful appeal. Maybe you've been sliding and wandering away from him. Return to the Lord your God. Maybe like Israel you've played fast and loose with God. And you've been unfaithful to him. And just as God is willing to to take Israel back. He's willing To take you back to. To to forgive you. He's calling on you this evening. Return to the Lord your God. How does one. How does one go about doing that? Hosea gives us. In these opening three verses. uh, Three steps. To return. One. Confess your sin. This is in verse two. Confess your sin. It says, take with you words and return to the Lord. Uh, We can almost think of the prodigal son and going back to his father. But he, he knows that there's words he has to say. There's words he has to say. Take with you words. Confess your sin, in other words. It's not an easy thing to do. But it's vital if we're to experience reconciliation with God. We need to come and confess our sin. Asking for forgiveness. I wonder if you're here this evening and and you've never yet trusted in Christ. And I wonder if one of the reasons is because you find it hard to say sorry. You find it hard to say sorry. That's where a relationship with God begins, you know. I'm sorry. It's a very humbling thing to have to say. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. 
And of course, it's a step not just at the beginning of the Christian life, but, but every day, every step in the Christian life. Hosea says, go to him. Take with you words. Say sorry. The first step in returning to God. But we go further than confess your sin. And we turn from our sin. We turn from our sin. Verse 3. Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses. We will never again uh, say our God to the work of our hands. And that this is, speaks of an acknowledgement that needs to be made. It's a turning away this time. Not just saying sorry, but a turning from sinful practice. We're not going to look to Assyria anymore for help. We're not going to make gods of things in the world anymore. God, you're the only one that can save. You're the only one that can restore. And I'm not just saying sorry for my sin, but I'm turning from my sin, turning unto you. That's repentance, renouncing sin and turning unto God. And then a third step in returning Believe that God is willing to forgive your sin. Believe that God is willing to forgive your sin. The very end of verse 3, a line we could easily pass over. In you the orphan finds mercy. Hosea surely is reminding the people here of God's character. How he's a God of mercy. A God who cares for the fatherless. A God full of compassion. That's the kind of God he is, Hosea says. A God in whom the orphan finds mercy. Hosea, or Micah would put it, a God who delights to show mercy. Maybe you're thinking this evening, you've wandered too far from God. That you've compromised, that you've gone too far. Hosea says he cares for the orphan, you know. He cares for the orphan, this God. He's a, he's a God of exceedingly abundant mercy. That's how he's wired. Never think that he'll never take you back. Never think he will never take you back. That's a lie from the pit of hell. He will receive those who come to him through Jesus Christ. Believe he's willing to forgive sin. God's wonderful appeal to return. And the three steps in, in returning. Confessing your sin. Turning from your sin. And believing God will forgive your sin. Maybe you're thinking though. How do I know that I'll be accepted? How do I know the door just won't be slammed in my face if I take these steps? Let's come thirdly. God's assurance of forgiveness. God's announcement of victory. God's appeal to return. Thirdly, God's assurance of forgiveness. Verses 4 to 8. What will happen when sinners come to the Lord? In repentance and faith. What happens when the backslider returns? What happens when the prodigal makes the journey back to the father? Two things. One, restoration. Verse four. Verse four. I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely. For my anger has Turned from them. Are those words just tremendous? God's speaking of his immediate receiving of the returning sinner. No questions asked. His love for them freely, unconditionally. Isn't it marvelous that when we confess, when we turn and when we come to the Lord... In a moment, in an instant, he, he receives you back freely. And his anger is turned away. What a wonderful.
wonderful thing to read. There's no grudge here. There's no lasting bitterness. There's no dark side to the love of God. As as soon as the sinner returns, love and intimacy is restored and enjoyed. It's the foundation of the gospel. All because he turned his righteous anger away from us to turn it upon his son at the cross. The the anger doesn't just disappear. It's it's directed. It's, It's propitiated. It's taken and absorbed completely by Christ. Restoration. And then the second thing that happens. Refreshment. Refreshment. Verses 5 to 8. And we have a beautiful description of life here. Of vitality. I will be like the Jew did Israel. He shall blossom like the lily. He shall take root like the trees of Lebanon. His shoots shall spread out. His beauty like the olive. His fragrance like Lebanon. Uh, these pictures of course. In a warm country. The Jew. Just is absolutely essential for fertility, for for fruitfulness. Uh, The blossom of the lily spoken of here uh, was almost a proverbial for for being attractive, uh, beautiful. Being like a tree of Lebanon, that's another good thing. Uh, That's like saying, us saying today, as strong as an oak tree. Wonderful word paintings again from Hosea. Assuring God's people not only of their being forgiven. But of their flourishing. Not only of restoration. But of refreshment. All looking forward to a day when the Messiah would come. And restore and refresh his people. When through his death. He would turn away the anger of God from them. And for all who believe in him, he would lavish fruitfulness, blessing and beauty. Verse 7. They shall flourish like the grain. They shall blossom like the vine. That's the picture. A picture of utter refreshment. Maybe you just feel spiritually Dry and and done this evening. Spiritually barren. Spiritually hard. Oh friend, look to the Lord. For your refreshment. Your spiritual renewal. Turn to him in the words of this chapter. That he might be like dew to you. That he might cause you to blossom like, like the lily. That he might plant you beside streams of living water. Causing your roots to sink down deep. Flourishing in the Lord Jesus. Are you in need of this kind of refreshment this evening? This kind of revitalization? I would encourage you to to pray through this chapter. To take the words. Use the words that are here. And ask the Lord for this refreshment. What wonderful words at the end of this whole prophecy. Words of assurance. Words of forgiveness. Words of flourishing. Hosea has been writing this tremendous love story. If you like, a love letter. A love letter. Have you ever written a love letter? I'm sure there's some in this building. I've written a love letter or two. And surely every good love letter ends with a PS. Ends with just a little postscript. A final word. Let's come fourthly, briefly, Hosea's PS. Hosea's PS. Verse 9. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the upright walk in them. But transgressors stumble in them. Here's the wise counsel at the end. For everyone who 
who has reached the end of Hosea's prophecy. This is the big lesson. God's ways are always right, Hosea says. His ways are always right, and the upright walk in them. Ultimately, the mark of the true believer is that he walks in the ways of the Lord. So if you would be wise, learn from Hosea. Learn from this book. And that's how the book ends. With God saying to you this evening, Come back to me. Come back to me. You do not have to go the way of eternal death. Come back to me. Maybe come to me for the first time. And bring with you words. Walk in my ways. Are you at a loss for words? What words do I bring? I don't know what to say. Let me give you three words. Three words. Sorry. Please. Thank you. I'm sorry, God, for how I've lived. I'm sorry I've spat in your face. Please. Please forgive me. Thank you. Thank you for sending your son to die in my place. Sorry. Please. Thank you. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. Amen. As we're able, let's stand in prayer together. Let's pray. Lord, we are sorry for how we've lived. We see ourselves in adulterous Israel time and time again. And this book has, O oh Lord, shown us aspects and sides to our sin that we haven't enjoyed at times. Aspects that have been deeply uncomfortable and troubling. And we are sorry, O oh Lord, for the times we've turned our back on you. Please forgive us. Please forgive us, O Lord, our waywardness and our rebellion. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross in our place. Thank you that there is victory over death. Death does not need to be the end of our story. Hear us, O Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. We sing together from Psalm 1. Psalm 1a. Singing the whole of this psalm. Psalm 1a, using the tune, number 268. And this psalm that speaks of that refreshment, that fruitfulness, that vitality that Hosea spoke of, that thriving life being planted by the waterside. So let's sing this whole psalm together, Psalm 1a, uh, as we bring our service to a close.